I remember one of our first COVID positive patients. He was a guy that had gone for spring break in Miami. And he came back and he was admitted in the ICU for trouble breathing. And his friend, best friend was outside the unit, wanted to drop him off some toiletries. And so I went and talked to the best friend and he said, I know I can't come in, but can you please give him this and please tell him I love him dearly. And so I went in the COVID unit and I talked to his friend, our patient, and explained that we can't have any visitors, but he wanted me to tell you that he loved you. And he started to cry and I started to cry. And we talked for a minute and he said, um, can I ask you something? I said, sure. He's like, no, never mind. It's a dumb question. And I said, no, no, no questions are dumb right now. And he says, am I going to be okay? I says, well, your vital signs look good. You're how many days in? He said, five days in. And I said, well, you're talking and just continue to exercise your lungs. And he cried some more with tears of joy and gratefulness that, you know, I gave him some hope. And later that day he was intubated and I was crushed because I told him he was going to be okay. Nine days later, though, he was extubated and um, I went and visited him on the floor. Now, when I went and saw him in the ICU, I had my isolation mask on and gown and gloves. And so it's hard to recognize people. But when I went in his room, he recognized me right away. And he said, oh, my God, I've been thinking about you every day. And um, I said, I felt so bad because I told you you were going to be OK. He's like, yeah, but look, I am. And he was down to one liter of oxygen and um, he was able to walk to the bathroom. And uh, so it gave me some hope. I left and I called my husband on the way home and I was crying and I said, I don't think I can make it. I don't think I can get through this. It's just two more months of this and I can't, I can't do it. And he's like, don't look at it like that. Just look at it as you did one day. And so um, that gave me a lot of strength to know that, well, I got one day done out of 59 more left to go. So it helps to talk about it, even with somebody that doesn't know your world. Um, and it definitely helps to take things one day at a time. Um, and we made it and we're 30 days in and we're still managing. Um, talking helps, I'd stay late um, most nights just to talk to the night shift. And if I could see them smiling, then I would, able to go home at night and sleep so I was so afraid for them they're the true heroes in the ICU and the ER that march in there with their PPE scared to death um but if they could at least smile a little bit I had some assurance that they would be okay um the support of the community. I know the community feels helpless, um, but they fed the nurses every shift, every day. Um, and food helps, yeah, food helps. That's the only thing that helps right now is at least if they don't have to worry about cooking for their kids or cooking for themselves, if we could just give them a little bit. Um, the community made masks and headbands and devices to hold the masks so their ears weren't raw. There was pain. There was breakdown on noses and ears. There was fear of testing positive. It was horrible watching patients die without a uh, family. I've always been a proponent of good death and um, Watching people die without anybody there is just torture. And I know it's gonna hurt a lot of nurses. Um, we're gonna need a lot of coaching and counseling after this is over. And I know it's hard for the families to not be there. Um, I'm just praying that we're done with this soon. I'm just praying that we're done with this soon, she says. That is Jennifer Steenberg, who runs nursing uh, at the ICU at a large Houston hospital. And, you know, you see this again and again now from frontline health providers talking about what they're going through, talking about uh, stamina among themselves and how they need to support each other and how there's going to be a need for, you know, long-term counseling and support. Uh, and as uh, Jennifer Steenberg said, coaching uh, to help people 
through this, given how hard they are working and the circumstances in which they are working with people who are so sick and so many people dying. I mean, this is why people are thanking health workers all over the country, right? This is why people are sending food. You know, she said there, uh, food helps. You hear, you hear about people sending food to the health workers at hard-hit hospitals all over the country. And it's not like it's a national effort to do that. Individual communities all over the country are deciding to do that on their own. And it's happening because people are so grateful. That's why the orders to open everything back up, you know, just assume our doctors and nurses can handle it all. Our hospitals, they can handle more. I mean, that's, that's, that's why I think it's so discordant to have this open it up political movement. Hand hospitals will be fine. Healthcare workers are fine. They can take a lot more alongside the way Americans feel about our healthcare workers. I mean, the vast majority of Americans do support our health workers. And they do, the vast majority of Americans, Democrat and Republican and neither, vast majority support the continuation of stay-at-home orders to try to limit the spread of the disease, to limit the assault on our health workers and our health systems. I will tell you, this was also nice to see this weekend. This is from the Salinas Valley uh, in California. People turning out to thank farm workers, uh, people picking produce, thanking them for their essential work. Um, and as we understand it, this has happened a few times in the Central Valley in California since the epidemic got so big. But this was Salinas, California this weekend. It's really nice to see. The United States is approaching one million cases of coronavirus now, which means that uh, we're about to, well, we, I guess now already, we've, we've got roughly quadrupled the size of epidemic.